Can we clap our hands to the Lord Jesus Christ and give him praise? The Bible said clap your hands, all your people, and shout. Don't just clap your hands. Clap and shout. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all your lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Can we do that together right now? Can we enter into this place with a voice of triumph? With a loud voice of triumph. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. It is a privilege and an honor to be with each and every one of you and I have been the recipient of the blessing. I know that as speakers we are supposed to come and be a blessing and I pray that each and every one of us are. However, there is a rhythm. There's a rhythm between the pulpit and the pew and there is a rhythm of anointing and so there is the preacher that volleys the word and then the congregation volleys it back and hell wants to disrupt the rhythm. But when there is a spiritual rhythm between the pulpit and the pew, there is a rhythmic power and anointing that hell cannot stop. And I feel that rhythm in this conference. I feel a spiritual power that's going to last beyond just today and tomorrow and the next day. And so I want to say thank you so very much for welcoming my wife, my daughter, and myself. And it is a distinct privilege and an honor to be with you. And then, of course, to the executive board, to all of the distinguished leaders who have made this possible, um, thank you very, very much for the opportunity. And, and then to Brother Enzi. Yeah, you know, when I was in Bible college in my 20s, he was just in diapers. That's the way he made it sound. He made it sound like I was this old man. He's like, I was just a little kid. He wasn't that young. He wasn't that young. And I'm not that old. I'm not that old either. You say I'm that old. So, Brother Enzi is a tremendous man, tremendous leader, has impacted this organization, and I value his friendship very close to their entire family, and they mean the world to me. And then to, to team up with Court Chavis, oh my Lord, you are in for a blessing tonight. You are in for a blessing tonight. Excited about that. Pastor Harvey, your teaching ministry, and I don't know if that was your first time to ever hear a message on the gifts of the Spirit, but if it's recorded in any form or any fashion, I would strongly encourage getting that recording, going back and listening to it again, because it was so insightful, so practical, so down to earth, yet it opened up the window of the supernatural. And so thank you so much for that powerful word. And then I'm looking for Brother Pastanio. I think they're in a meeting right now. Oh, my Lord. After he preached today, I'm like, and they're going to have to put up with me after that? Oh, my Lord. He preached the house down today. Preached the house down today. <laughs> Tremendous word. And yet, I'm highly privileged to be able to preach to you today in this afternoon service. And I, I want to turn your attention today to the book of Mark. The book of Mark chapter 5. While you're turning to Mark chapter 5, I give honor to Brother and Sister Buckland, Brother and Sister Robertson, uh, Brother Castano, and all of the leadership. To the music team, tremendous, tremendous worship. You guys are awesome. I mean, absolutely incredible. I know that I said it yesterday, but please allow me to say it again. Brother Dean, thank you so much for your leadership, for the organization, the planning. Um, tremendous, tremendous work, tremendous work. I want to preach to you today a message that I feel like God spoke directly to my heart, to my spirit about this conference, 
And the, the scripture reading is in Mark chapter 5. I'll begin with verse 1, and I'll read through verse 10. And I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadareans. And when he had come out of the boat, that is Jesus, when he, Jesus had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, no, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And I want you to notice verse 10. When, when Legion, which minimum, minimum was 6,000 devils inside of one human being. When these spirits came out, they started begging Jesus and they had a request. They had a prayer request. And their request was... They begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. If I can't have the man, let me have his family. If I can't have the man and I can't have his house, don't make me leave the neighborhood. Don't make us leave this jurisdiction. And I want to speak to you from this subject today. Lingering spirits and soul ties. Spirits that linger and want you to tie your soul to those spirits. I'm talking about generational spirits that don't want to leave your family. I'm talking about generational demonic powers that had a hold of your great-grandfather, perhaps even your great-grandmother, they are dead and gone, but those spirits have lingered and they're trying to stay around the family system. We need to get rid of some lingering spirits in this place today and send them out of the Asia Pacific country. They're saying, well, you can cast them out of a man, but you're not getting us out of the region. And we're saying, you're going to leave the region. Come on, I need some help in this house right now you got to make up your mind. As for you and your house, you're going to serve the Lord. You're going to serve the Lord. And those lingering spirits are going to have to depart. Can we pray together before you're seated? Would you lift your voice? Would you lift your voice? And would you help me pray right now? Would you pray in the Holy Ghost? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I love you, Lord. I'm asking you to have your way. I'm trusting you, God, to speak to us today, speak to every individual, speak to churches, speak to countries, speak to this region, in the name that is above every name, and everyone said in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for your prayer. You may be seated. Clap your hands to the Lord. Clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise. I've been pastoring for about 28 years. Um, I've had the Holy Ghost for 35 years, right at 35 years. Brother Harvey said today that his first message that he preached, he was shaking in his boots. His knees were shaking. Well, I've got news for you. I've been preaching for 34 years, and I still shake. I still get nervous. In fact, I was very nervous when I got the invitation to be able to come and have the wonderful privilege of preaching to you. And so I don't know necessarily that that ever quite leaves a person. 
who is a preacher because we carry such a weight of responsibility. And I have asked the Lord in pastoring because as a pastor in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas, I have witnessed when a young person perhaps will pray through and get the Holy Ghost, but mom and dad struggle spiritually. Or maybe dad leaves the family, mom stays in the family, and dad's spirit lingers. And I've watched young people struggle. I've watched young people struggle, not that they're possessed by the spirit, but there's a lingering spirit. They can have a powerful Sunday church service. They get the victory, and by Wednesday night Bible study, they're in depression. They're in fear. They feel like they don't matter. They feel like they're damaged goods. And I asked the Lord some questions. I said, Lord, can dark demonic spirits linger in a person's life? If so, is this person contagious? And can spirits transfer to family members and friends? Can people pick up spirits from one environment and then they take them into another environment so that the spirits that lived and persisted in one environment because they attached to a person, they attached to a young man, they attach to a young woman, the young man or the young woman moves to another church. They move to a different situation. Can they be carriers of these lingering spirits? So the youth group is going fine until two or three people, new people show up, and all of a sudden you have this spiritual turbulence in the church, and you're saying, where in the world did this come from? Could it be that there are lingering spirits that attach to human beings, and the human being has lived with that lingering spirit for so so long they don't even know they're carriers of the spirit and so they come into a new environment and there are these issues and immorality and perversion and and sexuality and pornography that starts to happen in a youth group or a or, or, or a hyphen group and you're saying what's going on here are there lingering spirits that want to attach to you and go into another environment so that those spirits can literally hijack that youth department. Can the carriers of these spirits take on the identity of these spirits so closely that the individual is unaware of even being a carrier and those spirits camouflage themselves behind human spirits? And so there are often times when you're dealing with a human spirit, but then just seconds later, you're dealing with a demonic spirit. And you don't know which one you're conversing with, and you don't know which one you're talking to. Because somewhere they picked up that spirit in an environment. Not that they are possessed by that spirit, but they are manipulated by that spirit. They are oppressed by that spirit. They are abused by that spirit. And so they carry that with them. I'm talking to you today about lingering spirits and soul ties that you need to be awakened in this house today if you're a carrier of these lingering spirits and you need to make up your mind I'm going to be a carrier of the Holy Ghost I'm going to be a carrier of something that will disrupt the strategy of hell I'm not going to let hell manipulate me and destroy a church or destroy a marriage or destroy a home I will be a carrier of God's anointing and we will break the dysfunction so then the question must be asked what is the biblical response from those who are spiritually healthy so that the spread of these spirits does not happen and perpetuate in ongoing generations. So now we come to this man of Gadara. Gadara was an environment where lingering spirits from generations back would attach to new generations. And if the new generation did not defeat the old, ancient, lingering spirits, humans would be puppets on a string acting out a satanic script that was handed to them because they never defeated the lingering spirits of a mom and a dad. Are there any young people here that you have your mind made up? Those old, ancient spirits that want to stop your church, that want to stop your call of God, that want to stop your anointing. 
it is going to end and conclude today. And you are going to defeat those lingering spirits. And if you have tied your soul to those spirits, you're going to untie yourself and you are going to be free. You're not going to be a puppet on a string. You're not going to be a puppet and a slave to those spirits. You're going to cut that string. You're going to make up your mind to have victory. And the Bible said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Those old lingering spirits aren't going to stop your revival. Those old ancient spirits that tried to stop your region are not going to stop your region. But you've got to make up your mind today. I'm going to cut those lingering spirits from my life. No more influence over my mind. The location of where this man lived ironically described the man's inner life. Gadara was a forest area with peaks and valleys. And when you traveled in these peaks and valleys, there were areas that there were very dense woods and confusing zigzag pathways. According to Hitchcock's Dictionary of Names, Gadarean means a place that is surrounded or a place that is walled up. If you go to Gadara and you look upward into the cliffs, the eerie sight of the ghostly tombs shockingly stand out. Some of the tombs are said to be 20 feet square and so this is where they would take the dead bodies of people and there were little recesses inside the cave and there were, there were corpses or there were dead bodies there. This is where the demon of Gadara lived. When he would go into the cave shackled and chained, he would have to go into the cave and see all of the human bodies, all of those who had died and, he had to, and there were lingering spirits in Gadara, lingering spirits that perhaps would speak to him and tell him, you're never going to make it out of Gadara. You're never going to make it out of these issues. You're never going to make it out of this pain. And so this was a prison to this man. And it was so tormenting that he would begin to cut himself. It was the prison of the man. And Satan would love for that to be my prison. And Satan would love for that to be your prison. you got to make up your mind in the youth group. If you got to step over some people that backslid. If you've got to step over some spirits that tried to take out your youth group, you're not going to die in the cave of your past. You're not going to die in the cave of your failures. You've got to make up your mind. You're not going to get me, spirit. You're not going to get me, spirit. You're not going to get me, spirit. And you've got to make up your mind to come out of that cave. You've got to make up your mind, I'm going to come out of my past. I'm not going to be that person that my, my dad was or my mom was. I'm going to come out of that past. Are there any young people here that are willing to walk out of the cave of yesterday? You're willing to break those shackles and come out of Gadara. If 6,000 devils could not stop that man that did not have the Holy Ghost, you have the Holy Ghost. 6,000 devils cannot stop you when you make up your mind, I am coming out. Can we clap our hands and give the Lord praise today? Can somebody make a joyful noise unto the Lord and give Him praise and shout to Him with a voice of triumph? In the name of Jesus. The demons beg Jesus to allow them to linger in the neighborhood. If you make us come out of this man, let us stay in the environment, in the church, in the family. We do not want to be disembodied, and we do not want to be homeless. You understand that? 
Those spirits, those lingering spirits do not want to be disembodied. They're looking for a human body to enter into. No wonder hell is fighting your worship because the Bible said your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and the devil wants to stop worship in the temple and that's why he wants to shut your mouth up. That's why he wants to put your hands to your side. He doesn't want you clapping your hands. He does not want you shouting unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. He does not want to be disembodied but when you begin to praise him you let him know you're not coming into this body you let him know you're going to be without a house because you're not coming into this temple you're not coming into this temple you got to make up your mind your body was made for the Holy Ghost your body was not made for sexuality your body was not made for pornography your body was not made for drugs your body was not made for self-harm your body your body was made to have a move of the Holy Ghost your body was made to shout your body was made to run the aisles your body was made to clap to the Lord your body was made to have victory You need to let hell know who's in charge in this house right now. Lingering spirits are not in charge of my future. Lingering spirits are not in charge of my praise and my worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead and praise him. Go ahead. Let hell know who's in charge right now. Let hell know who has a seal on them right now and who has the authority, the authentication. You're not a substitute. You're not fake. You're not a genuine imitation. You are an apostolic generation who has power over lingering spirits. Woo! I'm just telling you, you're not going to go home and backslide. You're not going to go home and quit. You're not going to go home and fail. You are an overcomer. It's clear in this passage that demon spirits will linger and enter any environment willing to entertain them. They will, they will tempt you in order to tie your soul to the experience and the memory. Soul ties, what are they? Soul ties are unhealthy connections with people or spirits who interfere with our walk with God. And so when we, we, when we look at the, the life of the, the Gadarean, we have, to, we have to curiously wonder, did he get confused about his identity as a man and tie his soul to the lie of transgenderism and gender fluidity where he becomes they? And he ties himself to that. And, and he, he wrestles with that. Can I preach to this younger generation right now? You don't need to be confused about your identity. Biologically, if you came out of your mother's womb a man, you are a man until you go into the grave. Biologically, if you came out of your mother's womb a young woman, you will be a young woman for the rest of your life. You're not confused. There's no gender fluidity. You don't change from a guy to a girl to a he to a she to a they. you got to make up your mind. That's a lingering spirit that wants to possess your generation. But you got to make up your mind. I was made in the image of God. Male and female gender distinction with divine purpose. Can we give him praise right now? We are not tied to that. We are free from that. A soul tie. These lingering spirits and soul ties. I'll tell you what it's like. Can it happen at a conference? Can it even happen at APYC? For those didn't come here serious about the move of the Holy Ghost. And even while the preacher's preaching, it conjures up some old lingering spirits. 
And if we're not careful, because we've been carriers of these spirits, uh, we identify with them, and we don't even recognize that we've identified with them. And they can even walk into a church service. And they'll give you enough slack so that you can have a move of God today. And you can have a move of God tonight. But when you go home, they'll start pulling on you, saying, you're not going to get out of my hole. You're not going to get away from me. I am a lingering spirit that's had your family. I am a lingering spirit that's had your parents. I am a lingering spirit that's had your grandparents. And you're not going to go to a two-day conference and get out of my hold. You've got to make up your mind. Lingering spirit, you're not going to have me. I'm not tying my soul to you. I'm not tying my soul to homosexuality. I am not tying my soul to lesbianism. I am not tying my soul to transgenderism. You've got to make up your mind. I don't care if your mom, your brother, your sister, whomever, you cannot let that spirit tie you up. Can I tell you something right now? The pulpit, you got to make up your mind when you're preaching. You don't have something tied to you in the middle of your preaching. When we came into the church, we burned every bridge. When we came into the church, we got rid of the soul ties. When we came into the church, come on. Come on, APYC, it's time for you to untie yourself. It's time for you to get beyond the lingering spirits. I'm preaching to you up there. I'm preaching to you up there. I'm preaching to every soul in this house. You've got to untie yourself. You've got to cut yourself free and let God give you victory. What are you tied to? What are you tied to? Did violence and abuse repeatedly occur in that man's family, convincing him that he was damaged goods? And he tied his soul to a false identity of being inferior to everyone else, insecure, and he's never quite good enough. I'll never be better than sister so-and-so in the youth group. Because of what I've been through in my family, I'll never be able to be a preacher. Because of my past failures, I'll never be able to sing again. And so he, you tie your soul. You tie your soul to the pain. You tie your soul to the abuse. You tie your soul to the failures. Did, was he ever called into the ministry? But his failures pushed him into the cave. And his failures pushed him into isolation. And his failures uh, made him feel like he could never get beyond the voice of his failure. You didn't make it. You failed. You're never going to make it. You're a quitter. You're a quitter. You know that you just came to this conference to have fun, but you're not really going to put spiritual priorities in your life because you failed in your past, and you're just here with your youth group, and you're just here with your friends. But when you get back, you're going to go right back into backsliding. When you get back home, you're going to go right back into the soul ties. There are too many lingering spirits. There are 6,000 of them, and there's no way that you can overcome all of them all alone. You are a liar, devil! Greater! Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world! Come on, you gotta cut yourself loose in this house. You gotta make up your mind to be set free in this house. You gotta make up your mind you're gonna cut yourself free and cut yourself loose from every past failure, from the pain, from the abuse. Can we give him praise in this house right now? Yes. Here's what happens. It can happen to a musician. It can happen to a preacher.
take the rope. Don't, don't pull me around right now. But I can even, if I've tied my soul to these spirits, I can even be preaching. And they're saying, go ahead, McLaughlin, preach. But when you get finished preaching, we're going to pull you right back. And you're never going to be able to really be the person you want to be. And then, I'll, and then I'll, I'll come back. Can I ask you some questions? Was there a secret painful memory that trapped that demon of Gadara to the point of feeling hopeless? And he tied himself to the dark pain of his past. Please hear this preacher right now. A soul tie starts with a conversation and grows into an unholy covenant that starts to feel like it's unbreakable and I'll never be able to get out of this. A soul is a, is a, soul, a soul tie is formed when a teenager gives up their virginity and they feel like they can never overcome the horror of that past that they gave their purity away in their adolescent years and it keeps pulling them back and pulling them back and pulling them back and pulling them back and And you try to get away and it gives you enough slack but you can never break free this was the demon of Gadara his soul was tied to his past failures A soul tie is made when men and women commit emotional and spiritual adultery that leads to physical adultery and they tie themselves to the other person that is not their spouse. Come on to church with me. Come on to church with me. A soul tie is made when something bad has happened and you make a promise to the other person that you'll never tell. And they tell you if you ever tell, I'll blackmail you and I'll ruin your reputation. I'll ruin your call. I'll ruin your future. And you've got these deep, dark secrets on the inside of you that are soul ties. And it just keeps you tied. And you can never quite get the victory. And you can never quite overcome. Be careful. Silence is where satanic growth occurs. He was a serpent in Genesis 3. He was a lion in 1 Peter 5. And he became a dragon in Revelation 20. You don't wait until the devil's become a dragon in your life. You kill him in your garden. You kill him when he's under your feet. You get rid of him before he ties your soul up. You get rid of him before he can take your mind and take you into Gadara. You break out of that. Can somebody in this house make up your mind? You're going to untie yourself. You're going to be free from the lies of your past. The lingering spirits will not control my future. Please hear me. A soul tie is when you take on the identity of a wound. A soul tie is when you take on the identity of being hurt. A soul tie is when you take on the identity of your injustice more than the identity of Jesus Christ. The wound defines you more than Jesus defines you. The hurt defines you more than Jesus defines you. The injustice defines you more than Jesus defines you. The bitterness defines you more than Jesus defines you. That is what a soul tie is. Uh, Our identity and our ownership is in the seal of the Holy Ghost. As Brother Pastanio preached today. And the seal broke the soul tie. I said the owner broke the soul tie. You're not tied to your failures anymore. A soul tie is an open door that lets lingering spirits in and out. In and as long as you're tied, as long as you're tied, those lingering spirits can come in and go out. Come in and go out. Come in and go out. And this happens from wound attachments. This happens from what's called trauma bonds. A trauma bond, listen to me, what's left unattended in adolescence will be acted out in adulthood. 
That's why you got 50-year-olds acting like 12-year-olds. Because they never got healed from the trauma when they were 12. And they're a 50-year-old man acting like a little boy because they tied their soul somewhere. I'm trying to help this generation right now. Don't you dare leave it unattended. Don't you dare leave the door open. you got to make up your mind to handle it as a teenager. you got to make up your mind to handle it right now. Don't go into your marriage wounded. Don't go into your marriage hurt. Don't go into your marriage full of pain. You'll act out. What you don't want to act out. Can we clap our hands and give him praise right now? A soul tie is a deeply embedded spiritual and emotional bond that becomes a new identity. Negative scripts are written out and hell and lingering spirits and soul ties will write out your script you'll never preach again you'll never sing again you'll never dance again you'll never worship again you'll never be on fire again You'll always go through the motions, but you'll live as a hypocrite. You don't really mean what you're doing right now. You know that this isn't going to last beyond this week. And you'll, they'll give you a script. But every negative script needs an actor. Every negative script, hell takes the script and tries to hand it to your whole generation and say, act this out. Act this out. Be a quitter. Never be an overcomer. You'll never be anointed for the rest of your life. But what this generation needs to do, somebody tear up the script. Somebody tear up the script. Devil, I'm not leaving. I'm not living that negative script. I'm not your actor. I am a preacher. I am a worshiper. I am a dancer. I am a praiser. And I will not act out what you want. My wound doesn't define me. My pain doesn't define me. My past does not define me. Jesus, Jesus defines me. Come on, generation of apostolics. We need you to break the script. We need you to tear it up. Woo! You say, how am I going to get, how am I going to untie? How am I going to untie? Let me tell you how you're going to untie. You're going to get your pastor in your life. You're going to get the man of God in your life. And that spirit's going to try to pull on you. But the man of God is going to come and cut the soul tie. With the preaching of the word. With the preaching of the word. you got to make up your mind. He's going to cut it. He's going to set you free. He's going to set you free. you got to make up your mind. He's cutting you loose. He's cutting you loose. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Get out of that pew. Get rid of the lingering spirit. Goodbye pain. Goodbye wound. Goodbye hurt. Goodbye injustice. Hello victory. Hello anointing. Hello power. Come on, it's time to worship. It's time to worship. Brother Pasano. You know what this represents? 
It represents it got broken at APYC. It's no longer got me tied. It's gone. It's broken. It's gone. It's broken. Come on, you got to make up your mind. I'm not leaving bound. I'm leaving free. Make up your mind. I'm free. I'm free. Woo! Yes. I'm going to tell you how we're going to send those lingering spirits. We're going to get behind the youth president, and we're going to follow his leadership. We're going to get behind him, and we're going to deal with the lingering spirit. We're going to get behind the general superintendent. You want freedom in this house? Get behind anointed leadership. Get behind the man of God in your life. I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to this preacher. Gadara, 6,000 issues. 6,000 issues. How do you counsel 6,000 issues? You're going to be in therapy for the rest of your life. They say, I don't know so much in the Philippines, but I know in America, they say this is a therapy generation. The ther everybody's on some kind of prescription drug for depression and anxiety. Everybody. The, the, youth, the youth in Dallas-Fort Worth, they talk about what kind of prescription drug they're taking because they got so much anxiety. They've got so much fear and they got so much depression. And they tie the, and I'm not, I'm not preaching against that if that helps the quality of life. But what I am saying is some of these issues are spiritual. I do believe in, in, in brain imbalances and, and chemical imbalances, and I understand that. And so if there can be a medication that can help level that out, I'm fine with that. But what I'm saying is, is that sometimes there are some lingering spirits that don't want to leave your family. There are some lingering spirits that want to wound you. And then the next generation gets wounded. And the next, and so you hear your mom and dad talking about how they got hurt. And you hear your grandparents talking about how they got hurt. And so you got hurt. Somewhere you got hurt. And you don't even know who hurt you or how you got hurt. Hear me. Hear me. The man was wounded. Wounds seek Attachment. That's why a, un, a wounded teenager will find another wounded teenager. And because they're in so much pain, they do things in their relationship that bring further pain because two wounds found one another. And so you got a wounded man and a wounded woman and they start dating and then they commit sin and they give their bodies over to the wound and they're more wounded now than ever before because wounds seek attachment. But there's also another attachment. It's either a wound to a wound attachment or there is a wound to the word attachment. And we need a wound to the word attachment. When Jesus got on the island of Gadara, watch this. When Jesus stepped on the island of Gadara, the man saw him, ran and worshipped him. The wound entered the presence of the word and when the wound got in the presence of the word, the wound began to worship and the wound became a witness. God is going to give your generation a witness because you're taking your wound into the word and you're worshiping through the wound. Lingering spirits, you're not going to control us here today. Woo. Me, Carl McLaughlin, 20 years of age. I walked into my house. I walked into my house, Brother Dean, and I told my mom. I said, Mom, I'm about to commit suicide. I was on drugs, was not raised in the church. I was on drugs. I'd blown my mind so bad. I'd burned every bridge. 
And hell gave me a script and said, I need you to act this out. Go kill yourself. I walked into my house. I'm crying as a 20-year-old young man. And I said, Mom, I need help right now. I'm about to kill myself. She looked at me. Mom was an alcoholic. In my house, three to four times a week, I watched my stepdad beat my mom, blood flowing down my mom's face. Blood flowing down my mom's face. My stepdad would beat her. I played baseball all of my life, and I had a, back, back then, you had a, I had a 34 ounce, 34 inch, 35 ounce Easton big barrel baseball bat. And from 12 years of age until 20, I listened to that man beat my mom up. I listened to him cuss her out three to four times a week. And as a 12-year-old boy, I would sit on the edge of my bed crying with my door closed in my bedroom. And I would say, God, and I wasn't even, I wasn't a Christian. I was, I was a messed up kid. I was a major messed up kid. You talk about legion. I had legion working through me. And I would sit on the edge of my bed and I would say, God, I don't even know how to pray. Would you please tell that man to quit talking to my mother that way? If he doesn't stop, I'm going to walk into the kitchen and I'm going to beat his brains out with my baseball bat. But I was too little. I was 12 years old. Hit the fast forward button to being 19 years old. And I was much bigger than my stepdad. I walked in. I was strung out on ecstasy. I was strung out on LSD. I, I, was, I had probably three to four drugs in my body. I had alcohol in my body. I got home at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And when I walked up to my door, my front door was wide open. I knew what was going on. They were fighting. There was glass that was shattered by my front door I knew that he had probably busted the glass out next to my front door and when I walked in I was with one of my best friends Brian Garcia I said Brian don't come in with me I have no idea what I'm about to walk into you talk about negative scripts you talk about a young man struggling with the call to preach when I got the Holy Ghost and God said I've called you to preach and I had so many soul ties I said there's no way I can be a preacher there's no way I can be a preacher I had murder in my heart I wanted to kill that man even after I got the Holy Ghost I still wanted to inflict pain on that man I had a negative script I walked into the house I walked around the corner and I looked at my mom and blood was flowing down her head dried up blood but you could see how it crusted up I said mom what happened she said son please don't do anything to Bob so I knew he was in the house. Went all the way back to being 12 years old. And I went into my bedroom and I grabbed my baseball bat. I'm talking about a big barrel, Easton, that I used to hit home runs with. And I said, I'm really going to hit a home run right now. I'm going to bust his head open. Literally. I was so full of anger. And he had his bedroom door shut. I had the Easton baseball bat. And I just reached up and I kicked that door open. And he was laying in the bed. I said, Bob, you better get out of this house right now. He jumped up and I put the baseball bat on the side of his head. And I said, I am about to kill you right now. And he said, let me just get out of this house. I said, you don't get one thing. You don't get your clothes. You don't get one thing. You get out of this house right now. He left. I was in the front yard. He backed up the car, threw it in drive, hit the accelerator, came over the curb to try to run me over. He wanted to kill me, and I wanted to kill him. Negative script. Carl McLaughlin, you'll never be a preacher. You'll never be able to pastor. You've got too much anger inside of you. You have too much hate inside of you. You have too much hurt inside of you. But I had a friend named Andy Howard who witnessed to me and invited me to the Pentecostal church. And he said, Carl, if you'll just get baptized in Jesus' name and receive the Holy Ghost, God's going to change your life. I went to the Pentecostal church. I said, God, I want to kill somebody. I'm going to kill myself. I need you to break these generational curses. And I need you to set me free. Do you think for one minute... When I had that baseball bat in my hand and put it on the side of his head and told him I was going to kill him. Do you even believe for one minute 
that God had this moment planned where I would be preaching to you in Manila. But God said, I have another script for you, Carl McLaughlin. You're not going to die. You're not going to the pen. You're not going to prison. You're not going to be killed by your drug dealer. You're, you're going to make it out. You're going to make it out. And I'm going to send you to a younger generation because they need to hear that if I could do it for you, I'll do it for them. I got rid of the lingering spirits. My soul is no longer tied. Listen. I had the Holy Ghost, and every time I would pray, Bob would come up. Every time I would pray, my stepdad, Bob, would come up in my mind. You know what it was? I tied my soul to him, and I told myself, one day I'll kill him. One day I'll kill that man. One day I'm going to murder that man. I tied my soul to him. But when I got the Holy Ghost... God kept bringing him up in my mind, bringing him up in my mind, and I realized it was stopping me from the call of God. I realized what I had tied my soul to was preventing me from moving forward into what God had called me to do. A stepdad and lingering spirits in a family were stopping me. Listen, I got on my knees. I didn't even know how to pray. I didn't know what to do. Man, I didn't. Let me, just, let me tell you how biblically illiterate I was. You know the Bibles that have little tabs? So that when you, they say turn to Acts chapter 2 verse 38, you can look on that little tab and see Acts 2. And you know, I had to buy a Bible that had the tabs because I didn't even know what two thir- I didn't know what the colon meant. That's, where, that's who I was when I came into the church. So I bought this little Bible that had the tabs. I didn't even know how to pray. I just knew that the spirit of truth was pulling Bob up in my memory because Bob was controlling me. And and if if I wouldn't have been healed, okay, work with me now. There's a principle called transference. And there's something that happens in your brain chemically called firing and wiring. So whatever triggers you, it fires your neurons and then it wires to that experience. It wires to that memory. If you do that habitually, you create thought patterns. So that's why Paul said, by the renewing of my mind, I've got to repattern my mind. I've got to, be, I've got to think a different way. I fired and I wired these memories and my soul was tied to that pattern. And I needed something to to restructure the pattern because of the chemistry of my brain. And that's why Pentecostals talk in tongues in a service, but they go right back to the pattern because they haven't repatterned their thought processes. You with me? Well, here's an issue. It's called transference. If Bob is out of my life, but I don't get healed from what I went through with Bob, I'll transfer it onto another human being. And they're going to act just like Bob, and they're going to trigger something, and it's going to take me back to that pattern of thought, and my anger will be released on him when he doesn't even deserve my anger. But it's called transference, and it should have been handled with Bob. I didn't know all this stuff. I didn't know all this stuff. I just knew that God was dealing with me, and I prayed. I said, okay, God, I was 20 years old. Hadn't even gone to Bible college and, and, and seen Brother Enzi when, when he was in diapers. I said, okay, Bob. I said, I said, God, if you'll let me see Bob, I'll ask him to forgive me. God is my witness. The next day at work, the next day at work, I walk into Burger King. And there was a line of people, and guess who was standing in that line? My stepdad. Bob was standing right there. The man that from the time I was 12 until the time I was 20, I tied my soul to a voice that said, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. But I got the Holy Ghost. I got baptized in Jesus' name. I can't kill him anymore. Well, what do I need to do? I need to forgive him. I need to forgive him. I need to forgive him. That was hard. He'd done too much to be forgiven. I didn't want to forgive him. But there's no way I could be here right now if I would not have forgiven Bob when I was 20 years old. (sighs) 
I looked at Bob. I looked at the door. I looked at Bob. And I said, this is too much for me. I'm out of here. And I started to walk out. And the Holy Ghost stopped me and said, turn back around. You made a promise to me that you would forgive him if I let you run into him. I turned around. I walked right back to my stepdad. I said, Bob. He looked at me and he said, Carmichael, he said, you look different. I said, I'm in church now. I got the Holy Spirit and I need to ask you something. Will you please forgive me? Will you forgive me? And I need you to know that I forgive you. What was I doing? I was untying my soul. Bob doesn't control me. My past does not control me. My pain does not control me. Jesus, Jesus controls me. I want you to lift your hands high. Right now, under the power of the Holy Ghost, the person that wounded you, the person that hurt you unjustly, and it is not fair. I know it's not fair. But when you come to the cross and you look at him who was crucified, that was not fair. But he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Release them. Right now, if you have to speak their name out loud, Bob, I release you from my soul. I get you out of my life. I forgive you. Would you do that with me right now? That's it. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. I'm untying myself. Devil, you're not going to get this generation. Not in the Philippines. Not in India. Not in the UK. Come on. This is your revival. This is your revival. And those lingering spirits are not going to stay in the region. You got to send them packing. You got to make up your mind to get them out of here. Get them out of your home. Get them out of your family. Get them out of your church. Get them out of your mind. Get them out of your heart. Get them out of your spirit. And be free. Be free. Be emotionally free. Be psychologically free. Be physically free. Be spiritually free in the name of Jesus Christ. Be loosed. Be free. Now as the musicians come, as we begin to sing, as you lift your hands, you're going to feel those lingering spirits leave from you. You're going to feel them. They're going to leave your family. What you're starting in this altar is going to go to your family. And when you experience that, you give God a shout of worship. Jesus. Jesus.